Well, this morning we continue in Philippians, <clears throat> as has just been read for us, Philippians and the third chapter. In the first chapter, we saw uh, Paul, we heard Paul speaking to us about living above the circumstances. He was writing from jail and was saying, still, trust God, it's going to be okay. <clears throat> and we've been singing about that again with the Lord on our journey. And then last week we looked at his exhortation to us to be like Christ, to be like him, to imitate him, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And today he's speaking to us to press on, press on toward the goal. The goal. And in the first few verses that were not read here, he's, he's saying that we do need to be careful. We do need to watch out. We need to be, to be watching and to be, uh, to be diligent. And at the same time, he gives a, uh, gives a very strong case for not trusting in ourselves, not trusting in our, our background or anything else. And then he gets to the verses that we've read, and he said, whatever the gains were to me, whatever my background, whatever good things anyone might say about me, I consider it all a loss for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he actually says, I consider all of those things garbage. Wow. He said, I'm not taking it as that I am someone so, so special, but he recognizes who he is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, that's where I put my energy in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever those gains were to me, I consider them all loss, verse seven, for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he had his, his racial gains, religious reputation, his lineage, his birth, so many things. His pedigree, pedigree, his learning, honor that was paid to him, popularity, substance, all of those things. And at one time, the comforts, now remember he's writing from jail, but at other times, he was comfortable. And he said, all of those things, I count them as nothing. Verse 8, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Wow. Anything and everything except Christ is nothing. Hmm. There's a good place for a big, hearty amen. <laughs> but isn't it hard? It is. And I'm so glad that Paul is just straight up with us. We hear who he has been, we see who he is, and we hear the struggle, we hear the tension. And it's hard, it's hard because we don't want to give up the comforts. We don't want to give up all those things. And, and it's funny, Sue and I, we have this, this saying, you know, this, this idea of suffering for nothing. Suffering, we can suffer. And if we need to suffer, we'll suffer along the way, but to suffer for nothing, there's no reason. And so at the end of the day, to suffer because you didn't put the hot water heater on, that doesn't make sense. Enjoy the hot water, it's there. Enjoy the lights, they're there. All of those kinds of things. And if they go out, well, if you suffer for a while, it's hopefully not a big bad, you know, not a bad deal. <clears throat> I lived for so many years without water, without electricity, for 10 years, never had water, never had electricity, never had a cold soda unless I went to the hotel. And it, some would say, in fact, some of my friends, oh, you're suffering over here, this is terrible. The way you're suffering, that was of course in Africa. But at the end of the day, it wasn't suffering, it was just daily life. And how many of you grew up on the farm? Yeah. And did you do some suffering there? Was it always easy? No. <laughs> it was not always easy. A lot of hard work, but you get through it. And at the time, it's just another day. And for Dennis, it's just another cord of wood to chop. <laughs> What's a cord of wood? So you just do it and, and all. And so you don't want to suffer for nothing, but if you're suffering for a purpose, suffering for something, then, then that's okay. But anyway, he says, all of these things, I look at my life and his life had been good in what he thought was serving God up to that time. But he realizes that so much of it, it was about energy, it was about reputation, it was doing all of these things, but not for Christ. But then everything changed when Christ met him on that Damascus road. Everything changed. And then he asked the Lord, what will you have me to do? And what a big question. And it wasn't a matter of, okay, Lord, you give me a plan and I'll tell you which parts of it I will do. But he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? 
And from that point, he became obedient to Christ. And he was beaten, thrown in jail. How many of you ever been beaten and thrown in jail for something you never did? I won't say the other one because maybe we were in jail for something we did do. I met a guy one time in Vancouver and he came into the, the ministry there and oh, he was black and blue. He was a mess. And I just kind of looked at him and he was smirking. So I smirked and I said, what happened? And then he told me the story, but then he said, but I was really ignorant. I had it all coming to me. And I thought, wow, you must have been ignorant to have that coming to you. But Paul was beaten, thrown in jail for things he hadn't done. He was there for sharing the love of Jesus Christ. That was his crime. That was what he was arrested for. But anyway, he said, all of the things, all of my past life and all that I have done and my accomplishments, I count them all as nothing. And in verse 8, he says, I consider them garbage. Wow. Strong language. It's all garbage. It means absolutely nothing. But then he encourages and all of that for what? Why do I put it all aside that I may gain Christ and be found in him? Hallelujah. That was the change, the, the, the change. And so here, and though he uses the words later, really he's saying to us, press on in Christ. Press on in Christ. That's where I want to be found. I don't want just a reputation. I don't want just a, a position in the community. I want to be found in Christ. That's where I'm comfortable. That's the place that I want to be. And even though, again, he's writing from jail, still, he said, that's the comfortable place to be, to be found in Christ, even in this jail. And not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. And he recognized that though he had followed the law, though he'd obeyed, though he had taught, though he'd done all of those things, still the heart was not changed. And now Christ had come in and changed him and made him righteous before God because of his own blood, because of his own death. So that righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That's where I'm righteous. That's how I have come. And as you have had, and I have had many conversations, people who are trying, who are struggling, and we looked at that just very briefly, trying to work out their salvation by righteousness, trying to do the right thing so they become righteous. But it's a position that we have in Christ, in coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Righteousness through faith in Christ. Sins forgiven. He had no guilt, no condemnation. He had peace of heart, peace of mind, peace of soul, because he was found in the righteousness of Christ. And he's encouraging, press on. And we have four times where, where he's giving us those reasons to press on. And first off, press on in Christ. Not press on in religion, but press on in Christ. Be found in him. And it's a daily struggle and a daily victory at the same time. Faith in Christ, a life in Christ, service in Christ being in him. Jesus in John 15, he talks about it himself and he says, if I abide in you and you abide in me. That's the place to be. And Paul recognized that I want to be in Christ, not in religion, but in Christ. <clears throat> That's where the joy is. Paul paid honor to Christ, gloried in Christ and brought glory to God and glory to Christ. Righteousness from God, right standing before God, his position in Christ. And then he continues in, in verse 10, I want to know Christ. And so if you're taking notes there, the second press on is press on to know Christ. And I appreciate this again because Paul had known Christ for 30 years. He had walked with Christ for 30 years. And then he writes to the Philippians that I want to know Christ. Hallelujah. What a beautiful thing that after 30 years, it wasn't a matter of, oh yeah, it's just old hat. It's just the usual. No, he wanted to know Christ and he wanted to press on. He wanted to press in to know Christ even more and more. His walk was not old at 30 years. His walk was fresh. His walk was new. 30 years later, walking with Christ. And he says, I want to know him. I know so much already, and I've got to know him so much in these 30 years, but I want to know him. 
Some of you have been married 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. 50, 1, 2, 3, 54. Wow. Do you know your wife? Do you know your husband? Are there still some surprises? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and hopefully it's not getting old after all those years. Paul's relationship with Christ was fresh after 30 years, and he says, I want to press on to know Christ. He wrote in the Ephesians, to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, 18 to 20, I pray that the eyes of your hearts might be enlightened to know Christ, to know him, to know him more and more, and to grow in him. Grow in mind and heart and love and friendship and fellowship with Christ. And then the third press on, he says, and, and yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection. So again, after 30 years, he still is, is learning the power of God, the power of Christ. He didn't just get it on a Pentecost day for him, but it was a power that he sought. He wanted that power of Christ. I want to know Christ, and I want to press on in power. I want to press on in power, the power of his resurrection. I want to know that power, and I, I want to participate in that power. But the next part of it, it's the power of his resurrection and, and sometimes we don't like the and, power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. How many want to be participants in the sufferings? Hmm, all right, there's a few of us. And other hands went in the pockets. <laughs> don't want to make a mistake to, to just touch your nose right now in case. So he said, I want the power, but he also recognized the power and the sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I want to participate in his suffering. And what does that mean? That's a big, big thing. And, and we could probably take, a, take a, whole, a whole message just to talk about what that really is. So the power of his resurrection. But how do we see the resurrection power? We only see the resurrection power because of his death, because of his suffering. And the, the resurrection power, it's not a matter of he just revived and, and, and got up after a beating. But no, he was beaten, he was scorned, he was crucified, he was laid in the tomb. And then, that's why we shout, he's not here, he is risen, he's risen indeed. On Resurrection Sunday, he is risen indeed because he was dead. All the way dead and buried. Sue and I have laughed many times over the Swahili language because they'll say someone died. And you think, well, how could they have died? I just saw them just a day or two ago. When did it happen? Oh, no, it was last week. But it happened last week, but I saw them on Friday. And then they, they have these, these terms, so he's dead. And that means he was really, really sick, and maybe he'd even passed out and, and whatever. And then they have another, another way they stress it, and they say, he's really dead. And so that means maybe he went into a coma or something else, and so chances are he's going to die, but that's the way they express it. So what happened last week, he was dead, but not really dead. And then this week, he got that much sicker, so he was really dead. But then when they're getting ready to bury, then they have this word kabisa, which means completely. He's completely dead now. So he was sick, he got sicker, and so he was dead, he was deader, and now, He's really dead. He's completely dead. And the body can be buried now. And it just is so funny. So when you're having a conversation with somebody, you don't really, um, you don't really accept that someone has died. But when someone gets off their sickbed, yes, of course, we rejoice. And when they've been really, really desperately sick and maybe in a coma, we really rejoice. But imagine we bury them and they rise again. That's another thing altogether. And that's what Paul is saying, I want the power of the resurrection. And the power of the resurrection doesn't come until they're dead, kabisa, dead completely. That's when resurrection can happen. And so Paul is himself saying, I surrender to Christ. I want to live for Christ and I want to experience the power of the resurrection. 
I want to experience Christ's power in my life, and that means I need to die to myself. And we saw that in that first part, that I die to everything. I die to my pedigree, my upbringing, all of those things. They're nothing because I want to press on, to be found in Christ. I want to press on to know Christ, and I want to press on in power. And he says, I want that power, I want that resurrection power daily in my life. I want that power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, I want that power to be at work in me. So we see the humility and the cry of his heart at the same, at the same time to press on in the power of Christ. And that's why this whole letter, it talks about the, that growing in grace, growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and then growing in that power being crucified with Christ and being raised with Christ, participating in his sufferings. Do we participate in his suffering? Do we really mourn over this world that we live in? We see the, the shameful things that go on in our own city and across the country and around the world. Do we mourn over, there, over them or do we just kind of shake our heads as we, as we see these things on TV? Christ would mourn over the, remember as he, as he entered Jerusalem, he looked at Jerusalem and he cried over Jerusalem. Do we cry over our community? Do we cry over Salmon Arm? Do we cry over BC, over Canada? And so easy to point. And these days there's a lot of pointing down south and across the 49th parallel. Oh, look at them, look at them, look at them. Well, look at us. Look at us. It is not something to mourn about. And Paul is saying that Christ would have mourned and we need to mourn. And it's not just a mourning, but it's a time of prayer and considering and bringing, bringing change and bringing the good news of the gospel. He said, I want that power. I want to press on in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to know him, be personal, to be intimate, to be deep with the Lord Jesus to be so close, just as we've been singing, close to thee, close to thee. Heart to heart, as he said in the previous chapter, that every knee will bow and every tongue proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. And Paul again is stressing that I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord, to be my master in everything. And he continues on in verse, verse 12, not that I have already obtained this, and he actually finishes up in, in uh, verse 10 and 11, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead, or from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this, as, or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. I take hold and I press on, I press on to that goal, that goal of seeing Jesus face to face. And he talks about that in the next verse. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And again, we see his humility. After 30 years of walking, of 30 years of preaching, of 30 years of miracles, of 30 years of power, 30 years of church planting, 30 years of serving. And he said, I still haven't attained, obtained. I haven't taken hold. He longs to carry on and to bring it to completion. Within a few years, Paul himself was going to be martyred. And he didn't know the day, he didn't know the time, but he was looking forward to that time as we see that, that tension in the previous chapter. To be with Christ and to be here. Let me continue to serve until Christ calls me home. Continuing verse 13, the last part of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He was not looking for a quick exit. He was not looking for an easy way out. And he said, I will serve God with all of my strength. I will press on and be found in Christ. I will press on to know him more day by day by day. I'll press on in that resurrection power. And all of this, because I'm pressing on, to the day I will meet him face to face. That's the goal. And that's why we sang, sang today, higher ground and close to thee. So I'm staying close to thee, Lord, on this journey. But my journey is taking me somewhere. It's not just going around in circles. I've had the privilege of traveling many places in this world. And so many times as I have got into a new city, a new country, there's a landmark that I'm looking for. 
And it's kind of, you know, I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting. I remember going into London and some of the things, I wanted to see Buckingham Palace and I wanted to see the House of Parliament. I wanted to see number 10 Downing Street. And in those days, you could actually stand in front of number 10 and, and get a selfie. Actually, those days, we didn't have the cameras in our pockets, but someone would have to take the picture. But I remember some of, the, some of that excitement that, wow, Buckingham Palace. And as I, I was in London one time and staying with the family, and they asked me, what are your plans today, David? And I said, I'm going to Buckingham Palace. And they said, oh, and what else are you going to do? And I said, well, while I'm out, uh, outside of Buckingham Palace, I intend to see the Queen. And of course, the family all laughed. And they said, we've been here all our lives. And, and Mom, she was, I don't know, in her, in her late 70s. And she said, I've lived here in London all my life. I've never seen the Queen. And I said, well, I'm going to go to Buckingham Palace and I'm going to see the Queen. So they all laughed again and I smiled and off I went. And I went and I was so excited. It was kind of, wow, something I've seen on the news, a place that I've seen in the books. And here I am standing in front of Buckingham Palace. And then I noticed that the guards were starting to march a different way and they're starting to line up a different way. And then I saw the big, I think it was a Bentley, drive up. And there's a flag on the Bentley. And I thought, you know what? I think the Queen is coming. And sure enough, the Queen exits, exits the, the, the palace and she gets into the limousine and she drove past me waving as she went. I thought, wow, isn't this so cool? So you imagine what the conversation was at supper that night. So David, what did you do today? I went to Buckingham Palace and saw the Queen. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, there's, there's that excitement. And, and Sue and I, we, we visited Rome and we were walking along. We had the things that we wanted to do and see and we'd come by train. Now we're in the center of Rome, but where are these things? So we went for a walk in the evening and then I just looked down this side street and there's the Colosseum. It was, wow, this is so cool. We really are here. And I can tell you stories of other places. And there's that excitement. Well, Paul is talking about that excitement. I'm pressing on to the goal. And it's not London. It's not Rome. It's not Istanbul. I'm pressing on to the goal. And I am going to go to heaven. And I am going to see Jesus face to face. There's a good place for a hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. That's what I'm pressing on to. And that's why I do what I do. And that's why I get thrown in jail. I'm pressing on. I'm getting to know Christ more and more. And 30 years I've known him. And 30 years I've loved him. And I love him more and more. And I'm getting to know him more and more. And I'm experiencing that power. And then I'm pressing on. Because one day when this life is over and I draw my last breath. Hallelujah. I'm going to see him face to face. Wow. So the journey here is worth it all. The struggles here is worth it all because we will see him face to face. And it's not just the goal, but we see him face to face. We see him in this life. He sees him in power. He saw him in power as, as, as he and Silas were there and, a, and an earthquake came and shook the, shook the chains off of, their, off of their feet. He saw him in power. He saw the lives that were changed. He saw that girl that was, that was full of demons and saw her set free. And he said, this is the power of God. This is the power of Christ. And what a privilege to walk with him, to be a part, to, to serve him in this life. And I'm pressing on because it doesn't all end in a cemetery somewhere. It doesn't all end in death. But that's when I'll see him and then I win a prize. I get that prize, and, and he wrote to, the, uh, wrote to Timothy that I have kept the faith, and henceforth there is laid for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award me. Amen. He was not ashamed of that. That was an award he was waiting for. The Lord will award me that crown of righteousness. But he includes all of us, because he says, and then he also has that same crown, for all who love his appearing, all that know him. Hallelujah. I press on toward the, the, the prize, toward the goal, to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This world is not my home. It's not just a cute little ditty that we sing and get our banjos out and whatever we play. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through, but yeah. Paul could have written that song. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through and I'm having a blast on the journey. 
I'm having so much fun. And here in jail, I'm having so much fun. And we see this whole letter is just about thankfulness of joy. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through, but I do have a goal. I'm going to that home beyond the blue. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you again for Paul and his encouragement that this world is not home, but Lord, you walk with us and you make this journey so meaningful and so special. Lord, help us to be like Paul to press on in Christ, to press on to know Christ, to press on in the power of the resurrection and press on toward that goal of the day that we will meet face to face. Give us grace, O Lord, on this journey. Give us strength, O God. And again, help us with that power of the Holy Spirit day by day. Continue to lead us, continue to guide us, and show us where we can be involved in your work on this earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>